Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This end is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look sombre as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, in January 2012, Jefferson Bethke exploded onto YouTube. I don't know whether the correct term is download, upload, but whatever it is, he put a video of a spoken word poem on YouTube. Uh, the spoken word poem was titled very simply, Why I Hate Religion, But I Love Jesus. And he threw out ideas like this, quote, Religion puts you in bondage while Jesus sets you free. Or, quote, Jesus came to abolish religion. Or, when Jesus cries on the cross, it is finished, he's talking about religion and its place in the world. Not many people explode onto YouTube, but within three days, six million people had viewed his poem. By 2013, it had been viewed over 25 million times. Whatever else he was doing, he'd struck a chord, hadn't he? He'd struck a chord, an issue that many people have. They like Jesus, but they dislike religion. They like Jesus, but they dislike religion. Now, it's been interesting to watch Jefferson Bethke on YouTube because he continues to put videos up there and spoken word poems, and he's grown. It's been a really interesting journey of maturity as You've seen him interact with people who've criticised him, and he is orthodox. He believes that Jesus Christ died for his sins, and that is the way for forgiveness. But the issue remains, doesn't it? People like the idea of Jesus, but they hate religion. In this day and age, I can understand that. Religion doesn't have a good name, does it? Over the last 10 to 15 years, Acts that have been done in the name of religion have been exposed as variously false, self-serving, abusive, damaging, and at some points downright evil. But it still leaves that question that Jefferson Bethke raised. Is Jesus really anti-religion? Is Jesus really anti-religion? Let me pray. I'm going to think about that question this morning. Dear God, thank you for your word. Uh, it is always a remarkable thing when you entrust a sinner to preach on your word. And so we give you thanks that your grace is seen right throughout your community today. 
the grace that is given to gather us together, to expose the poverty of our spirits, to connect us to Jesus, and to bring us as your people together before you in fellowship with you and each other. Father, that is done by your word, and so we pray that as your word is before us now, your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts and minds so that we are a people who delight in it. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you've noticed that over the last few weeks, the biography that Matthew's putting together of Jesus has built slowly, hasn't it? Uh, Central to that portrayal of Jesus is that key idea we looked at over the last two weeks of fulfilment. He's everything that God promised to deal with a broken world. He's everything that God promised in terms of a right ruler for the world. He's everything that God promised to roll back the mess that humans have made as they have tried to be God. Over the last few weeks, we've seen that he's the end point of the pattern, plan and purpose of God, that he comes to bring in God's kingdom and the key essence of that kingdom is grace, isn't it? That's what we saw last week. The grace that is receiving what we humans do not deserve from the God we've rebelled against. That kingdom of God's not populated by good people, is it? Not populated by perfect people. It's populated by people who have a poverty of spirit who know that they are sinners. Remember, Jesus came to call people to repent, to turn back to God. And as those people realise the poverty of their spirit, their position as rebels against God, they throw themselves upon Jesus, don't they? They're connected to him because they see that he is everything that they need. Remember that genealogy from the first week with the names of the people who've thrown themselves upon the mercy of God? Well, Jesus has taken the disciples together for their first training session. Remember that image in our minds of Jesus and the 12 around him and then a massive crowd gathered around listening in. They're on top of a mountain. And as Jesus talks to these disciples, these wholehearted student followers of him, he talks about what it means to be a citizen of God's kingdom. Ah, That kingdom, as we've seen, is very different to any kingdom in this world. That kingdom is so different that it's often misunderstood and misapplied like we saw last week. Jesus has laid out the characteristics of the citizen of the kingdom. Do you remember the place he has in that kingdom? He's smack bang in the middle, fulfilling everything that came before and commanding everything that will come. Last week we saw what it meant to live the life of righteousness, reflecting the nature of God and showing God's grace to the community we live in. It's been a teaching that's full of confronting and blunt statements. And let me tell you, verse 1 of chapter 6 continues in the trend. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. At this point, Jesus, we must recognise, is a popularity machine, isn't he? Have you thought about Jesus in that sense? It's pretty foreign to our way of thinking today, isn't it? People are flocking to hear him from every walk in life. The religious authorities don't quite know what to make of him. The general population are dazzled by him. Everyone's trying to understand him. Many are misapplying him. Everyone wants a piece of him. And he's asked these 12 to be with him. Can you imagine the pressure of popularity? You're sitting there and Jesus has commanded you to follow him and you're sitting there and the crowd is so closely pressed against you that you can feel them behind you and he's talking to you. Can you imagine the pressure of popularity that you've got to measure up to what the crowd thinks? You've got to make sure you perform because you're one of the inner circle. And can you imagine it even further when you remember those words of verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You've got an image to uphold. In fact, we can take such a perfect command and pervert it so it becomes the impetus for performance art, can't we? Because we've got to make sure that if we're in the 12, we measure up to what everyone thinks we should be like. And into that temptation... Jesus speaks a very clear command. Be careful. Watch yourselves. 
Watch yourselves when it comes to the things you do because you're connected to me. I think that's a reasonably longhand, uh, accurate way of unpacking those words. The warning's very clear, isn't it? Watch yourself. Be careful. The actions he's talking about are there in verse 1 are connected and the, the NIV's gone further. I think it's actually a helpful translation. Uh, your acts of righteousness, they're, they're connected. Be careful of the stuff you do connected to the righteousness of you. Be, be careful of doing the stuff that shows you're connected to me. Put simply, I think he's talking about religion. The stuff people do because they say they're connected to Jesus. And the, the heart of the warning is connected to the motivation. And the motivation is seen by the audience, isn't it? The motivation is seen by the audience. Actions done for the audience of the crowd watching in, well, those actions are motivated by the desire for approval. The approval of the people who are actually sitting there right behind you, who are watching you, who are listening in. And in that case, the reward is very immediate, isn't it? It's received now, and we'll see more on that later. But there's an alternative audience, isn't there? Did you see that there at the end of verse 1? Your Father in heaven. Your Father in heaven. If you play religion for the mob, it cuts no ice with God. If you play your religion for the mob, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. He's pretty blunt, isn't he? Uh, That's the key for understanding religion in God's kingdom, that verse. It's the key principle that unlocks uh, the next three activities that God's people do. So I want to just pause, and you'll see on your outline that I make four observations. You didn't realise you could make four observations from one verse, but you can. And I want you to just follow through them with me. Uh, The first is this, Jesus is not anti-religion. Did you notice there that he doesn't say, don't do your acts connected to your righteousness? The assumption is you're going to do them. In fact, right the way through, the assumption is that these are reasonable things to do. Jesus is not anti-religion, but he's very serious about wrong religion. Jesus is not anti-religion. He's very serious about wrong religion. And this is the second observation. He wants us to get the relationship straight, the relationship that drives us, the engine for religion. Is religion about being in front of the people or is it about your Father in heaven? Which relationship is your motivation which drives you? In God's kingdom, religion is only about the relationship the citizens have with their father. The proper context for religion is this. God is my father. God is my father. Did you notice how much father language there is there? If you kind of just count up the words father, the way it's translated, in Matthew 5, three times. Matthew 6, 18 to the end of chapter 7, four times. In these 18 verses, 10 times. 10 times he says, Father. And when a word's repeated that many times, you've got to pay attention, don't you? The key for understanding religion is about God already being our Father, about already being in the family, being part of the community. Which leads to the third observation, God being our Father means that we are dependent. Jesus already made very clear how how you get into the kingdom. Poverty of spirit, that leads to being connected to Jesus. He's been very clear that that's the only way to enter the kingdom. So religion is not about getting in. Religion is not about getting in. It's not an elaborate list of actions that you have to do in a certain order at a certain time in a certain place with a certain group that establish your credentials for citizenship. Religion is not about public approval. Religion is about your relationship with your heavenly father. This morning, I'll admit it, we lit the fire. Well, I lit the fire, okay? That was after I couldn't find a jumper. But when my daughter came out, do you know her first question? 
Daddy, why is it? No, Warwick, it wasn't why there's so much smoke. Daddy, have you lit the fire for me? She's dependent on me. That question and her actions didn't make her more my daughter. She already is. But when she came and asked me that question, when she said, Dad, she said she was dependent upon me. Now, whatever your experience of the word father in this broken world, we know what father means in essence, don't we? It's a term that says someone is dependent upon me. It's a word that expresses dependence. Being poor in spirit, we're dependent on God to do something about our sin. Living in a broken world, broken by our sin, we're dependent upon the one we sinned against to do something about it. As people connected to Jesus, we're dependent upon him to deal with our brokenness. As people who've received what we do not deserve by grace, we're dependent upon God and Jesus. As citizens of God's kingdom, we are fundamentally dependent upon God. He couldn't pick a better word, could he? Father. No other word captures dependence so well. So when you bring those three observations together to the fourth observation, this is what religion is. This is what Jesus is dealing with. Religion is the stuff we do that displays God's relationship as Father with us. It's there on your outline. Religion is the stuff we do that displays God's relationship as Father with us. It's not about creating it. It's not about public opinion. It's not a checklist to be achieved. It's the stuff we do that shows we're dependent upon God as our Father. Now, if you think carefully about that, if you slide that definition away in your mental filing cabinet, you'll notice that it covers everything we do individually and as a group, doesn't it? You'll notice also that it covers everything we do every day. Now, that doesn't mean people haven't tried to define it more narrowly. And Jesus deals with that in the next section, doesn't he? Verses 2 to 18. Uh, here he picks up on three principal activities, three principal religious acts that God's mob have said, this is what defines us, a giving to the poor prayer and fasting. They're the standard religious things that you did. Uh, and again, Jesus is very clear in his structure. Did you notice that as we were reading? When, don't, but you. When, don't, but you. When, don't, but you. That's the structure he has each time. And as he uses that structure, he has three words that are worth noticing. The first word is hypocrites. That's kind of like a, the stock standard Australian insult, isn't it? Hypocrites. We like using that word, failing to recognise that we're probably just the same. But in those days, it, it was a, a, sta a word taken from the stage, from, from actors, like all the actors in those days were men, so when they went on a stage, they put on a mask to hide who they were and take on a persona, a character. I think Jesus has been very deliberate in choosing a word from the theatre because he wants to expose religion as performance art, doesn't he? Shakespeare's phrase, what, what was it, the, the whole world's a stage? And religion's the drama I'm playing. Now, the second word that occurs time and again is the word father. I hope you notice that. And the third word worth noticing is the word secret. Because the word secret is repeated, isn't it? And it's not put there so we're secretive about religion. It's put there as a phrase to encourage us to think about our motivation. The audience that we have in mind. Again, we need to be careful of Jesus' language. He's throwing out a number of theological hand grenades here. Uh, don't confuse the image for the point. It's not as if your left and right hand have two separate brains. Okay, The idea is do it being aware of your motivation. And the first area that he examines is giving to the poor. Look there in verse 2. Uh, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, on the streets, to be honoured by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. You saw the structure there? When, 
don't, but you. When, don't, but you. Don't be like the hypocrites. They make sure that people see their giving. It's almost like they approach Office Tree with one of those massive big charity checks you see on television and try to just wedge it in publicly so everyone sees what they're doing. They make sure people are aware of what they're giving, when they're giving, how they're giving. I mean, I, I don't think there's much in the trumpet imagery except that we know what it means to blow your own trumpet, don't we? And the aim is the praise, the honour, the applause of the crowd. Have you thought about what that means? That's it. Two bits of flesh coming together to make a noise. What a reward. What a reward. But God's people are to give differently to the poor, aren't they? It covers all their giving to the poor. It's to be done secretly, not to be secretive, but to be undivided in your motivation. You are a child of a father who has given you immeasurably. You don't have a debt to pay off. You can never do that. But because you have received grace, you give out of grace. You give in a way that displays that God is your father. Now, as we think about what that means practically, you've got to notice the base level. Jesus doesn't say don't give, does he? It's when you give. The assumption is that you are giving. So uh, the obvious question is, are we people who give to the poor? Notice he's not saying offertory. Uh, let me read you a quote from Grant Osborne. Uh, he wrote what I think is just a corker of a commentary on Matthew. He wrote this in 2010. Quote, statistics are an indictment to American giving. I saw a recent note that evangelicals gave 2.8% of their income a decade ago. Now the average is 2.4%. I know of one church that discovered that nearly all of their giving came from 15% of the members. Another where 30% of their members had given nothing the previous year. And that's just the offertory. The giving to the poor is above that, isn't it? I think it would be a reasonable translation to the Australian context, wouldn't it? Do we give to the poor? Out of grace, because we have a Father in heaven. Prayer is the next topic, and you've spent a bit of time on that last year, didn't you? You had a series on prayer, is that right? Yep. Uh, again, the pattern is very clear. Look there in verse 5, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is prayer as performance art, isn't it? where you choose words with more than one syllable and language that is religious and you lower your tone and a little whisper here and there in a manner that draws attention to your ability, not your father. But prayer is about talking to God, isn't it, as our father? Moreover, it's not about persuading or overwhelming God with fine-sounding arguments or special words or little intonations that will unlock his goodness. Look there in verse 7. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. I'd already lit the fire this morning, hadn't I? And then my daughter asked me if I'd lit the fire. I'm her father. I know what she needs. God is our father. He knows what we need. Prayer at its root is not about persuasion, overwhelming or unlocking God so we get what we want. Prayer at its root is a fundamental expression that we depend upon him who already knows what we need. 
Prayer is about dependence on the one who already knows what we know. I wonder if that's why prayer takes up such a big chunk in this section. It's smack bang in the middle, isn't it? And it's got the most number of verses because at its heart, it expresses most deeply our fundamental dependence upon God. Now, in case his disciples can't grasp what he's saying, Jesus then gives them a model prayer. I think there's a very interesting twist. I can't quite work out what this twist means, but it's very interesting that there in verse 9, Jesus moves to the plural, kind of like a Jeff Fennick use, if you want. And then on either side, he focuses on the singular, you, individual. I don't know what that means. I think it's important. Whatever else is going on with the model prayer, it's at least a model of what we do as a family, which then structures what we do as individual members. Now, when you look at that prayer after he's just come talking about babbling and using big words, the prayer is remarkably simple, isn't it? It's remarkably succinct, but its theology is profound. And so is its structure. The first three requests, who do they focus on? On God the Father, on the nature, the renown, the, the will of God as, as our Father. He's the one we desire to have displayed to the universe. And the second three requests then focus on our lives as God's people, our physical needs, our spiritual needs, and then our needs as we navigate this world on the way to the next. And the theology of the prayer is profound, I think. Our Father in heaven. The one enthroned in heaven is the one I call Father who knows whether I like multigrain or white bread. Have you thought about that? That the one enthroned in heaven is my Father who knows the type of bread I need. What a combination of ideas. The idea that God himself defines the world even though he's not of the world, he defines the world, defines the course of the world. That God himself can't be defined but we can know him to a point. That what we desire as the people of God is this world to be taken up and renewed daily. That my desire is, as I navigate this world, to be a forgiven debtor. That as I navigate this world, my desire is for God to protect me from the evil one. They're big ideas, aren't they, to think about? Is this how we pray? Well, Jesus draws us back in verse 14, doesn't he? Back to the reality of the existence of the people of God. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Whatever else he's doing here, it's not quid pro quo, is it? I forgive, so God forgives. Because that would make a mockery of everything that's come before, wouldn't it? But he's at least saying this. Don't think you can use this prayer to paper over a dysfunctional family of God who cannot display grace. No amount of saying the Lord's Prayer will hide the truth of a family that cannot display grace. So please be careful. Watch your acts of righteousness. Again, before we come to fasting, practically uh, the first question we've got to ask ourselves is, uh, do we pray? <laughs> when you pray, corporately, individually, prayer is a statement that we are fundamentally dependent upon God, not treating him like some cosmic vending machine in which, you know, which we put the right amount Individually, is this how we pray? As a community gathered together, is this how we pray? Well, the final act is fasting. There in verse 16, when you fast, do not look sombre as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your father 
who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We're unfamiliar with fasting, aren't we? Because we don't fast. Fasting is very simple. It's denying oneself food to express dependence upon God in the context of need, repentance or mourning. I've never really worked out fasting, but I know this much. As far as Jesus is concerned, it's not optional. It's when you fast. In fact, I can't think of a time where he says fasting is done and dusted. It, it is for those three years when the bridegroom is with them. But we're not in that time, are we? For Jesus, fasting was a reality, but it wasn't a public relations exercise. It was to be done as people depended upon God who is our Father. Again, the baseline question is, do we fast? I haven't. Why haven't I fasted? But when we do fast, it's about our Father in heaven, isn't it? Jefferson Bethke, I think, really did uh, in, in that poem from 2012 highlight a, a, a an opposition in many people's minds. Christianity is about Jesus, it's not about religion. I think Jesus is very clear. He's for religion. But he's opposed to wrong religion. He's for religion as the stuff we do that displays God's relationship as our Father with us. Jesus doesn't abolish religion. It's just returned to a reflection of God and his relationship with his people. And, and so I suppose the, the key question is, is this my understanding of religion? Is this my understanding of religion? On the one hand, religion and Jesus understood from the Sermon on the Mount go hand in hand. On the other hand, have I misunderstood what religion is? Limited to this and not to that. Perhaps I need to rethink it. Actions matter, don't they? Actions matter. We will display in our actions that God is our Father in heaven. That matters. It's not about being secretive. It's about thinking carefully about the relationship that drives our religion. The relationship that our Father has created with us. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. As we were reminded in the West this morning, we sit here in great comfort reading it. Our religion is not going to get us killed. We can go out in comfort. Father, we pray that that will not make us apathetic about the actions that display you are our Father. Father, we pray that you'll work in us so that our motivation is to acknowledge you as our Father in our giving to the poor, in our praying, and in our fasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? I'm going to go with Baxter there up the back. Yes, Baxter. Yes, mate. So Baxter's asked a very good question, which is, what does it mean to do things secretly? And let me, let me just return to something I said in the sermon. The idea of doing things secretly is to make sure you have your motivation straight. So one way to do that is to do this stuff secretly to avoid the temptation for acting before other people. I don't think Jesus is saying, for example, don't have prayer when God's people are gathered, because he does elsewhere. I don't think he's saying don't have a public offertory, because it does elsewhere. But he is saying get your motivation straight. Does that answer your question, Baxter? Thanks, mate. Any other questions? He wasn't put up to that, okay, so don't think that. Any other questions? Bail me up over more. Oh, Warwick. 
One question. Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I can see no reason for us to avoid fasting. I can't think of any biblical reason. Jesus doesn't give us one. I think for me, uh, I'm so busy that I just get lazy and I just go, I'm just not going to do that one. So, yeah, I, I can't think of any biblical reason for us not to fast. What does that look like? I, I think we've got to be very careful that we don't go, it's denying myself my iPod for 40 days because that's not actually fundamental to my existence. But my food is. And so that's why I think biblically fasting is always connected with food. Fasting is also connected biblically with three areas, uh, need, uh, mourning, and dependence. Okay? So w those three are significant for the context for fasting and the relationship. So, yeah, I can see no need. Uh, I've got a, a dear Christian uh, brother uh, who fasts one day a week. You, you wouldn't know it because he does what Jesus says. But he fasts one day a week, and, uh, and that's been a real, uh, it's something I've learned recently, that's been a real goad in my ribs <laughs> um, because I, I kind of gone, yeah, we can do it and it's worth doing. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Was there another hand up? Yeah, Pete. Uh, so the question is, because it's less common that people fast, is there less weight in that category than the others? It's a good question, but I think it looks for the evidence in the wrong place because... I think we're going. We're judging against what our culture does. I think fasting was very common back then. So back then, those three things were three things you did, and so in that sense, uh, it wasn't less common. I think the key the key reason you could say fast is because Jesus says when you fast. So for him, it's one of the things that you do as part of his people. The key issue is how you do it. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Pete? Well enough. Thanks, mate. No worries. Good. 